think we have uh, time for a few questions. Yes. You can ask me anything. If y'all had any questions. Yes. Sure. The question is, what happens if I come back to a role of, if sometimes I haven't done it for a really long time? Um, and, you know, this is, this is a tricky thing when you're a young singer because sometimes we learn things incorrectly and then, in a way, you want to put it away for a while and come back to it when you, uh, if it's an appropriate role for you, you want to come back to it when you can look at it with fresh eyes. However, by the time I sing uh, Desdemona for the first time, um, Coming back to it for me has always been an opportunity to layer it more dramatically, more with the text, more musically, to find nuance, to find more interest in the part. We never get tired of what we do because it's not like I had to sing Desdemona for eight years in a row every night like a friend of mine did at Christine and Phantom of the Opera. So, um, so coming back to it is usually a joy and really fresh if it's something great that we love to sing. Now, I did discover with Streetcar Named Desire last year that there is a statute of limitations on muscle memory, <laughs> and, and in fact, on memory period, because I had to spend a lot more time relearning it than I expected to, but it had been a long time, like 10 years, I think. Um, but most things remarkably will still be there. If you, if you grew up with music, if you have innate musicianship, you'll be amazed at how extraordinary musical memory is. And then muscle memory is just as great. I am sure that I'm gonna be in an assisted living in, you know, could be 10 years, could be 30, who knows, singing Tatiana's aria. And I may not be able to speak English, but I will be singing that aria. And <laughs> it's just, and it's always been, press the start button and don't distract me. So learning some things requires that kind of rote, physical, you know, and I, I have found when I come back to repertoire, and if, if it's been a while, I have absolutely found that my body remembers it before my brain, my conscious brain, so. But the whole thing about training your voice technically, that's always gonna be a work in progress. You know, even if you're at the top of your game, you might be tense from typing too much and, and have to figure out what's going on. I mean, so this is, you have to accept the joy of process. It's with you for your whole career. For, however, for the rest of your life, process is gonna stay with you and just make it fun, make it something you like. Yeah. Well, I don't actually think I had a problem with the note G. I had a lot of problems, but that was an odd thing for him to note at the, the pro that, that time. But I will tell you this much I know, every pitch has a different life in a different context. So context is everything. So if you're singing an aria with a high tessitura or that sits in the passaggio, that G is gonna feel like a B flat. You know, if you're singing something really low, that's a different thing altogether. If you know, so, it, it, it's it's the kind of thing I would I would practice on different vowels. I would practice thinking. Um, sometimes getting through the passaggio would help me was imagining an hourglass, and that's the narrow part. So there there are places. You know, I was talking a little bit about finding bloom on the top. 
but in the passaggio, you do want to kind of sit in a sort of more narrow, smaller place. No pressure, no, um, no weight. So, it, but every voice is unique. That's what makes singing so incredible and the teaching of singing so hard because each of you has a different instrument and I'm doing this big project at the Kennedy Center in November called American Voices and I want to preface it by saying that for every human being who's unique on earth and any of us who develop careers as singers who touch people who ultimately that's what it's about who, who sing the music that people love will never be heard again when we stop singing. You know, it is such a unique sound for each of us, and that's the beauty of it, I think. So that, the Finding Your G, that'd be a good title for a book, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, and by the way, uh, don't be afraid to experiment. You know, you're gonna have teachers and coaches who give you ideas, but go in the practice room and try 10 other things and find it yourself. You know, it's an exploration. Next. Yes. First of all, thank you for being here. It's been an honor to be here. I know that you did an album of alternative or indie rock music a couple years ago. Which I love. Thank you. And how did you manage to go back from genres like that? How did you kind of prepare for that? Well, the, I did, she's talking about um, uh, Dark Hope, which is a, a, a cover album of. Um, rock, college rock, a whole bunch of different bands. I, I can't keep them the title straight. But the, um, uh, the idea, first of all, singing with a microphone and recording. I mean, every time I've made a record like that, Haunted Heart also, I'm in the middle of singing something else that's really hard. In both cases, it was a Handel opera. So um, you, you're going into the studio and you're making a very intimate sound in order for it not to be operatic. And it will sound big because it's low and it's sort of spoken and breathy, but in fact, I barely am whispering. I never got tired in those sessions. Um, on the other hand, I did a Roots demo once in which I was really belting, and I had to cancel the engagement right after because I oversang. So you have to really find a way to do it. Use the mic, let the mic do the work. And I mean, David Kahn, who produced that record, even put effects on the voice sometimes, and one of the effects was called, literally, Voice of God. <laughs> and it added, it's all very subtle, but it added this extra depth to a couple of pitches, so. Um, but I wouldn't recommend it at your stage. I absolutely wouldn't recommend it. You should focus on one thing. If for no other reason, then there aren't enough hours in the day to be good at what we're trying to do. Um, but if you are trying to sing other styles, it's, it's, it, the challenge is to do them healthily. Um, there's, there's, we're starting to see a whole new um, movement in terms of teaching for non-classical and there are techniques that have been developed that work as opposed to those of us who've been trained classically. You know, my sister was trying to get me to help her sing this high belt aria in Les Mis, and all I could do is really, was, this is a long time ago, was really do a great imitation of Judy Garland. <laughs> ah! You know, just throw your head back. Ah! And, and it, was, it was pretty good, actually. Um, so, but, I mean, I think I hurt myself trying that too. <clears throat> anyway, you can't, you, it's just too hard, you know. And, and the people, by the way, who are doing this on Broadway have, they're singing in the smallest, tiniest place in order to do it eight days a week. And we can't. We have to project over an orchestra. Um, there's a program now at USC for non classical. They only take five singers and the singers have to make their own business plan. They have to create a website and they have to learn percussion. And two, one is, was taken into by Maroon 5 and the other was signed to Universal. So, I mean, it, it's rigorous. And, but it's for us too, we have to market ourselves now. You know, you, you have to know how to be on the online and social media and all of that stuff. Um, at the very least, to sell yourself in the beginning because there's so few managers who have the time to take all of us. And then, you know, how do people come out of the throngs, and that's true for everyone, is the record companies are no longer being the filter through which the rest of us buy music. It's, you know, what goes viral on the internet and who's interesting and some of it's staged. The same is about to be true for you all.
Any, anybody who wants to sing classical music is start to start thinking the same way. What makes me special? What makes me different? How can I market myself? Um, how can I be quirky? Uh, it, it's, you know, it, it's, it's all about presence. And by the way, you have to sing beautifully. <laughs> yes. Um, Regie, yeah, Concept Theater. In Germany, I actually saw Rusalka. Well, I don't, I have never done too much of that. Um, however, if you want to sing in Europe, what, what's happened, the movement in Europe has been, and by the way, it's, a, it's kind of a, a realistic um, solution to a problem that we have in classical music, which is that we've been listening to the same standard operas now for over 100 years. And very little new has become part of the standard repertoire. So the alternatives are to do premieres that interest people, that people come worldwide to see. They rarely get revived or revised. Um, another alternative is to change the productions. And in Germany, what's happened, and some of, the, some of the directors in Europe in general, is that opera has become performance art. So the music is a landscape, a beautiful one. Sometimes it's one we know, sometimes it's not one we know. And it gives them three hours on which to create a fantasy. And the fantasy very often has absolutely nothing to do with the piece. And sometimes there'll be a sort of an idea and a concept and it'll be political and they'll make some statement and they'll write something. I mean, I saw a Rusalka production that started when the curtain went up, you gasped because you knew what was happening, which was that they were depicting this horrible pedophile case in Switzerland where there were six or seven girls found in the basement. And these were, this was Rusalka and, the, and all of the water nymphs and the moon was, a globe light that was in the basement. And you just went, oh my gosh, that's horrible. And what's gonna happen? And who's the prince? And who's the princess? And then the act two, it sort of slid into the dancers and of course the man coming out in the tuxedo and the dancers dancing with slabs of beef and you, you lost it. Because then it was just farce, you know? Um, and I thought, God, you know, if they'd kept that through line, it would have been a devastating examination of Rusalka for today. So she, in other words, that whole thing was in her fantasy, was her mind. So um, I have missed this whole trend because I, my career has been more in the States or it's been at the Paris Opera. And most of my new productions were with Robert Carson. Even if they were conceptual, they were manageable. I also see costumes in advance. I know what the production will look like in advance. Many of you, if you go to Europe, won't have any say at all. Singers are now at the bottom of the totem pole because we are replaceable. Because there are hundreds of us and they're coming out of, you know, Eastern Europe, Asia, Russia, um, not just the US uh, and all over Europe. And, and so the director has a, the power now, bloggers have a lot of power too, and the director within, you know, with the exception of some big stars, uh, can really ask you to do anything and if you want the job and you need the money and, and you want to work and you want to climb that ladder you do it So that's Europe um, US is more conservative and there is work here And so it can happen here, but it's still we're very image conscious and you have to be nimble and be able to move on stage So things have changed dramatically since I started How do I decide what repertoire I sing? How do I approach new roles? Or how do I decide what to sing? Um, you know, I look at the history of the role. So if I see that 
all the major Brunhildes historically have sung a role, I think, well, probably not for me. And um, that's a good start. Uh, then I see if I like it. I see how it fits in my voice. Uh, it's not just if it's too loud or the orchestration's too loud. It's also if the tessitura is right, because we're all a little different. I like a middle voice. Uh, tessitura that goes up. I don't want to sit in the passaggio. I've, you know, I've done repertoire that way, but it's it's hard. Um, but it's it's personal. It is definitely personal. The the but you cannot sing things that are too heavy, too dramatic, too mature, um, too low. Those are the things to really stay away from. If you want longevity, if you want to maintain a useful quality in your voice, and um, if you don't want to get into technical trouble. So, uh, on the other hand, I personally don't see anything wrong with working on things that you think you will eventually move into, as long as you don't try to copy the people you're listening to, you know. And that's not easy to do, because we're, our, our minds say, but it's supposed to sound like this. And the next thing you know, you're going, whoa, you know, and you just can't even help it. It's not, we don't mean to do it. Or you hear the orchestra going, whoa, behind you, and you think, no, 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 no. I'm just singing this with my voice, and the next thing you think, God, I'm really tired. <laughs> so it's, it's, nobody can resist that subconscious pull on history. Go ahead. What advice would you have for choosing agents? Um, agents, I would say, it's helpful if they choose you. You know, they, it, you really wanna be with somebody who wants you. Um, it's so hard right now. You know, the business model for us is, uh, and for agents as well, is challenging because we don't, you know, mostly earn enough money for them to focus on one person or 10 people or what would be manageable. So they take 80 singers. So how can they possibly be working for 80 people? They can't. So I would say the most important thing is, this, does this person, do you think this person believes in you does this person gonna work for you, set you up on auditions, and give it a trial? You know, I, I'm not really, I'm too far away from the young singer business dilemma to know how many people are now asking for retainers and who's working on commission and what the commissions are. You, you'll know amongst yourselves how that works. Um, I still think you probably have to be, uh, I, I don't, you know what, I'm too far away from it. I don't even know if you still have to be in New York. You did, certainly, but. I'm not sure how it is now. With your schedule, how do you find the time and energy to keep working on your technique? I have to work on my technique or I don't get through what I'm supposed to be singing well enough. And um, if you have a certain standard and, and it also at my point, of course, I'm thinking about longevity and staving off, you know, the whole decline and aging process by really thinking more technically. There was a long period of maybe 12 to 15 years where I just sort of, wow, this is so fun, you know? Gosh, I'm just warming up in rehearsal and I'll do it again the next day and I'll sing a long opera role and I'll rehearse all day the next day because my technique was good. Uh, and now I have to think about it a little bit and I'm not as resilient. So we have one more. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, okay, it's so go ahead. You mentioned earlier you deny the pleasure of singing in French. Are there any languages that would be a particular problem or give you a particular challenge? Well, certainly there have, you know, some languages in the beginning are harder than others. They're harder to pronounce. I mean, um, I speak fluent German, so... That would be hard for a lot of people, but because I really had the culture in my ear. But yeah, I would say French is my favorite. Um, English is hard for people. You know, we get all caught up on that, and I love to sing in English now. So you have to enjoy languages, I think, or it, this is a hard career, you know, unless you're lucky to be in a Fach where you can only sing in Italian or German. Um, that, those are the only two languages that would make that possible, I think. Okay. Great. We are so delighted and really thank you for your time, Renee. Thank you.